Let's talk about uh, our unit number 11, which is now way out of order. It's not even remotely 11 anymore, but we're going to talk about CNC milling today. So we're going to go over what that means for end mill based machines, what that means for spinning bits and sort of how those fit together and how you get from an idea to making something. And then sort of where we're going over the, these two weeks together as a collective unit. So next up, our general plan is to go over CNC as a general concept to talk a little bit about G-code and post processors and how those fit together. So we're gonna see what those are and what those look like. Then we're going to look a little bit deeper into easel because that's going to be where most people's first steps are with a CNC and how that works with the Shipoko. And then we'll talk about VCarve and sort of how that works with all of the CNC machines at Makehaven. And I was just having a conversation with Lior, maybe even for the water jet. It might work in all of the CNC machines uh, that we have, but it's, it's definitely an exciting adventure to think about. And then sort of what are the next steps? How would you go on and do the next pieces? So there's plenty of, of details to look through. So first up, we're gonna talk in general about what is CNC. CNC is computer numerical control. And so really it's a, the term CNC doesn't refer to a specific type of machine. It refers to a way that you control a machine's movement and its action. And so up here on the slide, I've got several to look at. Um, the Gerber is this GIF up here. I just put a GoPro mount on the wall right above the Gerber. So when you go to cut your things, if you have a camera like that, that would fit with one of those mounts, you can do a time lapse. You take a video of, your, of the machine cutting your things. Here's the Tormach and the Shipoko. These are the three that are at Make Haven. And then here's a couple other ones. There's like this big CNC where there's an end mill in there that's just like held up against the panel with two bricks weighing it down, sort of a goofy thing. Those are like, I think four or $500 for that kind of a unit. There's this large scale industrial CNC. That's the kind of thing that you would get a, a job working and operating, uh, maybe building airplane parts to precision specifications. This one looks like a CNC that, that would tamp into uh, concrete and like etch away on concrete, which looks really cool also. And then here's some mills. But in general, if someone says that they're gonna CNC a part, almost always they mean a spinning end mill based part rather than the water jet or the laser or other things that also use computer numerical control. And so, oh, and the thing that draws on the wall at Makehaven, Kate, that is also, it would also have computer numerical control because at some level, it's probably G code that's running it and doing all of its things. But instead of an end mill, it's a marker, right? So. In all of those cases, the control structure is still computer numerical. It's still probably G-code that makes it happen. But it usually, when someone says they're going to see and see something, it means a spinning end mill. And so just to put it into context, it's good to see that that's sort of where we're going. These are both end mills. This is a roughing end mill. They have those teeth on them. The um, shinier ones are finished end mills. But in there, one of the big things to think about is if we're going to classify them as spinning end mill based machines, what is an end mill? And this is something I've been working with CNCs for years. Uh, and this is something that would always trip up uh, when I was teaching in a high school. It would trip up high schoolers. They weren't able to differentiate, oh, they all look like drill bits. They're all drill bits. And they are absolutely not. Um, so if, if you're unsure as to how to tell the difference, the key piece I've drawn in on both of them, for end mills, the cutting edges I've highlighted in pink, those are the sharp edges along the side of an end mill. End mills cut with their sides, whereas drill bits cut with their tip. And so essentially that's the core difference. There are some end mills that have sharpened tips. Uh, there are some drills that maybe do goofy things. I'm not saying that it's a universal piece, but that's the easiest way to categorize them. End mills cut with their sides, drill bits cut with their tips. And just that alone typically sets the price, right? If you need to sharpen just a little tiny area on a tool, it's going to be relatively simple to do. Those are often straight pieces on a drill where you've got a straight little segment or, or a wedge shape maybe that you need to sharpen. Whereas an end mill, oftentimes you're talking about a helical shape. So a, a spiral that goes around the bit. And that that's far more complicated. We have an end mill sharpener in Makehaven. Um, 
But just the fact that you need a dedicated sharpener versus a grinding wheel implies sort of the difference in price. End mills are things that on the cheap end, you're looking at five to $10 up to, I've heard of end mills that cost over a hundred. Um, whereas drill bits, you're very rarely gonna land in that category. Most of the time a drill bit is gonna be something that costs like a buck, $2. Or if you're buying you know, a whole saw, which is still sort of a drill bit and very ornate, you may hit in the tens of dollars, right? So, oh, you what? Whole saws for 250? No, no. Oh. End oh yeah, we've seen end mills for $250. Depending on like the exact nature of what you need in an end mill, you can really go very high in price. That it probably won't be what you need to do for the things that we're going to be doing in here. But if you're trying to make very high quality precision parts or fit all the details, it, they do extend quite a bit up into the price range. Now there's lots of different types of end mills and I wanna just highlight the fact that there are many, many different categories for us to look at and sort of what are the, the nuts and bolts of that. I've taken a little snippet of the McMaster car website just to give you a quick overview of what these different categories are. Square end mills are probably where we're gonna spend most of our time or maybe a ball nose end mill. These are the two biggest ones, but there's tons and tons and tons of categories uh, of end mills. There's even a, a catalog over by the, the Gerber and Chipoko between them in the wood shop where you can see different types of end mills that you could buy and play with. Um, but ultimately, we're going to look at lots of these different words. I want to just make sure that you've seen this terminology so that you, you know where it is as you get into it. And then I've underlined the most common of the tools that we're gonna deal with. Most of our end mills are gonna be square bottoms, so they'll have a flat bottom. A lot of the time anymore, tools are coated with something. So if you're buying a new tool, it'll probably have a thin coating of a very hard material so that it lasts a little bit longer. Made out of tool steel very often, it's cheaper than carbide. You can't run it quite as fast, but in wood projects, it's totally adequate. Um, most bits that you buy are often upcut bits. I particularly like a down cut bit, especially if I'm working in plywood. And we'll talk about sort of the nature of that in a second. And then the shank diameter. This is something that I was just talking with Kate before we started recording, is how do you know the, the shank diameter, the size of your tool? So we're going to go through some of that terminology in a second. And then flutes and some of those other pieces. So if we're talking about end mills, the, the first end mills and router bits were these flat cutters. So they have flat edges. Those are probably the simplest to make. They're the cheapest very often. They have a nice flat edge. Its diameter, it, its distance out from the axis of rotation sets your diameter of the tool. And so like this one is skinnier and then this is a bigger tool opening because those, those flutes are gonna be further out. Uh, whereas the shank diameter is the, the, the shank is the part of the end mill that the holder grabs onto, that your machine grabs onto. And so the shank for all of these look to be about the same, you know, across here. The shank is, is that size. For the Shapoko, that basically lowers into a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch. This Cat's Moses video is great. It shows just to see what these different shapes are, whether it's a down cut or an up cut. Those are the two kinds of spirals. Most bits, I would say, are up cut bits. That's because they're, they're great for routers. They hold the piece up to the router. On a CNC, uh, up cut versus down cut is deciding where your chips go. So that spiral, which is on an end mill, is going to decide which direction things go. And so this in here, uh, this video has got some, let's see if we can find the slow-mo motion down here in the corner. Here's his, and I don't want to do too much of this, but he, he has this great video that's showing how a down cut bit pushes those fibers down how a straight bit pushes them off to the side and how an upcut bit pulls them up. It's really a phenomenal video, which I would 100% recommend you go watch it in its entirety. Um, let's see, let's get out of there. It's got tons of good visuals to help make better sense of it. But basically a down cut bit is spiraled in such a way that it pushes down as you cut. And an upcut bit pushes up as you cut. The spin, is really helpful. The, the flat ones make like a scoop when you, that's a good question. The flat ones make a big scoop. They were the first bits. When you make a big scoop like that, you're sort of blunt force pushing your way through the wood material 
and it doesn't give it any direction up or down. So it oftentimes the wood will shake. And you can see that really clearly in Katz Moses's video. The down cut bit or the up cut bit, they give more of a shearing piece, like scissors doing a cut. And so when you do a down cut bit or an up cut bit, your, your knife edge is sliding across the material in a way that, that slices more than it just scoops. And so slicing is really important. Then the direction of the scoop is interesting also. A, an up cut scoop will sort of scoop it upwards, which gets the chips out of the cut that you're making, which is good for chip clearing reasons. It keeps it all a little bit cooler. The down cut tool scoops the, the chips down into the material, which sounds like a bad idea at first because you're putting all of your dirt and dust from the cut right back into where your cutting happens. Um, but they also take these fibers that are up on top and they cut them downwards. If we come over here and find, let's come back and do this. So here's just the quick synopsis. He's got this high speed video. You can see this chatter over here, that wood moving. Um, that's for a flat bit. These are a, next up I think he has a, down cut bit that's what we were just looking at so you can see it's cutting it downwards and then the last one that he does is an up cut bit and the the great part about an up cut bit is that it gets all of your chips away uh, but you can see here it's tearing away at the face veneer on this plywood it's more a problem for plywood than anything else but this really thin layer on the top gets pulled upwards and it rips at those fibers on the wood so that they can become a furry top um, it's your tools last longer if they're upcut because it moves chips and heat away from the cut, but they also give you that fuzzy edge that can be, if you're, if you want to not have to sand afterward, they can be problematic. Or if it's a really thin veneer, sometimes it'll take off big stripes of veneer. So you've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, and that is a really good question, Anna. Yes. You're, and, and Ada has you totally covered. You could cut a large area away with a up cut bit just to remove material and then come back with a down cut or even a ball nose which is sort of pointed in where it makes contact and, and go from there. And those are finish and roughing passes, which we're going to talk about in a second. But those are, these are the tools that you're using to make your cuts. There's lots of, there's tons of different options, but we have a whole pile of them here at Make Haven for you to play with. And there's a bunch of different ways to go. The standard ones would be the underlined, a square coated tool steel upcut bit that's a quarter inch shank and two flutes. That's the most common thing that you're going to use. And if you're unsure about what all these different specific options are, just stick to that for a while and you'll be totally good. Switch to a down cut for finishing and you'll be even better. Uh, compression bits are really nice because they do, like Ada's saying, they cover both of those realms, the upcut and the down cut which is actually shown right here. So this is a compression bit, this picture in the middle um, right here. They're just a little bit different because you have to be conscious of the fact that they're up cut for about, for a small section and then they're down cut above that. They're more expensive to produce. They're more expensive bits. Um, the cheapest, I think Ada found one for $15 on Amazon. Yeah, like 15, 15 to 30 somewhere in there for like the cheapest. I've also heard of, yeah, and we've seen them for over 200. So like compression bits are very, very nice. They're also very expensive. It's totally, a, I would say a new fad in CNCing. And so you've got to be conscious of uh, what you're doing with those. I'm going the other way. Oh yeah, yep. So that, yeah, and Ada brings up a good point. When you do the down cut, if you don't have spoil board that comes right up against it, or even if you do sometimes, it will chew up the bottom part of the cut. A compression bit is ideally the best of both worlds where you have to dial in your passes and some things. It may not be a first week ever sort of thing to worry about getting a compression bit. Just, just try and do some CNC in general, it's better. All right, so next up. If you're trying to put into context, we have several CNC machines at Make Haven. If you're trying to put into context sort of what goes where and how do you deal with end mills and spinning and making things, there's three that I have that, that I categorized here that I think are really worth looking at as falling into the same category. There's the Shipoko, which is this little yellow spindle logo guy. And the Shipoko 
just just got fixed today. Uh, Kate had a wonderful day playing with the Shapoko, and it's got a brand new, fresh new motor on it. Um, then there's the Gerber and the Tormach. Those are our three different machines that we're going to be playing with. And so on machine rigidity, they essentially line up in this order. Where the Shapoko is a wonderful hobby machine, it's really good for face engraving. Um, but it's got the lowest rigidity of any of the machines. So you get more run out. The spindle sort of wobbles on you, which is probably why it took the damage that it led that led to the brand new one being put in today. Um, and so spindle run out is, is more of an issue on the Shapoko than any others. It's still very good. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but then as you move up in size and really expensive a machine, you get more and more rigidity. As it has more mass, as the connections are more robust, CNC machines get stronger and more stable. So the Gerber is much larger uh, than the Shapoko. It's much heavier. And so it's much more rigid. Its spindle is connected much more strongly. So you have fewer concerns than you might with the Shapoko. Uh, it's also very big. So we're going to talk about it and some safety concerns that go along with it. And then the Tormach is, is inside of a box for good reason. It's very rigid. It's got a lot of force in a small area. And they want to make sure that everything that happens inside there stays inside there. Uh, sort of maps to the strength of the machine. Machine size for the, I wasn't exactly sure the size of the Tormac, but I think it's less than six, it's six inches, maybe six and a quarter inches is its only area that it can cut. Whereas the Shapoko is up to 30 inches. There's a box drawn right on the Shapoko and make sure that you stay inside that box. And then the Gerber is our biggest machine by far at four feet by eight feet. Um, these can cut different amounts of material uh, and different sizes that go with them. The Gerber is really exciting. We just got it to be online over the past week or so for it to be up and badged. Lior just made a video. And so this, the Gerber can fit a full sheet of plywood, and which is very exciting. We're looking forward to hopefully getting everybody in the class uh, parts of sheets of plywood. We're, we're working on some logistics there but to try and make sure that we have the ability to make big things next week. That's the goal. So we're gonna, the machine size is definitely a consideration when you're thinking about these machines. And then there's a barrier to entry. The easiest of the machines to run is the Shapoko by far. You can design it all in the browser, you set it all up at home, you come in, you press the button and you go, basically. The calibration routine is, is nice and straightforward. Um, we're gonna look at that in a minute. But it, it's just set the tool where you want it to be, and then it goes from there. Um, then we've got the Gerber that will that is a little bit easier, or is a little bit harder, sorry, is a little bit harder than the Shapoko. But we're going to try and give a tool path today that's as straightforward as we can be. And then the Tormac, the getting ready to cut is a little bit harder still. But I'd say once you're actually running it, because it's it's in the realm of machinists and CNC machinists for sort of professional use, it's like their scaled down version from Tormac. It's actually, once you're running the machine, I'd say it's probably the nicest of the machines to run. The easiest, once you get to the, I want to calibrate and run. Getting it prepped is a little bit trickier though. Um, also, we're going to talk about dog bones next week. That's the thing if you're trying to build buildable things. Or um, there's a book right here if you're in make haven physically the make design for cnc this is a little book that will walk you through sort of the logistics of how do you design furniture and things they have a chair on the front uh so you can design that way but um in here once we have some context for how those three machines fit together in the spinning end mills it's good to think about in general sort of what is the What's the pattern that you're going to do in order to design for and make something on these machines? You're going to start off in CAD where you're designing shapes that you want. And that can look like any number of different things. It could be Inkscape. It could be, uh, it could be Fusion 360. It could also be Adobe Illustrator. It could be lots of different things to get you started. But you start off in some version of CAD where you're doing a computer-based design. And so here I have a 3D model from Fusion 360. Then there's a CAM process where you're gonna to need to figure out, you have this design and how do you make it? That's an, another separate step. It's not quite as easy as the laser. The laser, the CAM is basically that little interface where you choose your speed and power reading. This has got a little bit more to it. You're gonna to have to think about the end mill and, and some of those details, but it definitely goes through there. 
And then the last bit is outputting G code, which can then be run by machines. And so here I've got the Shapoko running some G code. This is actually all one project and a thing that I have made. It's sitting in the back of Makehaven right now. Um, but in here, there's CAD to CAM to G code, and this is a G code viewer out to the Shapoko. Somewhere in the middle there, there's a post processor that helps you make sure that your G code is set up just right for the machine. And so that's it's one of the gotchas that can happen, but we're gonna go through what that is in a second. So G code in general is something that I have said exists. We talked about a little bit with 3D printers and it's the same exact species uh, as we saw then. It's just got a slightly different piece. Part of G code because it was sort of born from this CNC machining world is that it talks about spindle speeds. Whereas for a 3D printer, it would have been extrusion rates and then heating the nozzle. In this case, it's how fast are you spinning that end mill? How quickly is it moving to take out material? Uh, the good news is you won't need to do any work where you're writing G-code on your own. Easel, V-Carve, and slicers are gonna take care of making G-code for you. For slicers, I mean for 3D printers. But for a long time, you won't need to know to read or write G-code, but it is interesting and not a super complicated language. Here's a cheat sheet. This is a link if you can get access to the slides that are posted. Um, but you can look at all of these different codes. There's also a cheat sheet posted on the wall by the Gerber if you wanted to learn those things. Uh, it's definitely its own whole set of rules, but you can get away without needing to learn any of those for right now. The one last detail that's important to know exists in this tool chain of going from a design in CAD to CAM to G-code is the post processor. And so for Linux CNC, you need a post processor that's EMC2. Um, and for Inventables, for the Shipoko, that's all handled by Easel. And Tormac might have its own. So there's a ton of, there might even, and Leo and I were speculating if we could find one for the water jet. So that if you did your CAD work and then you did CAM work in VCARV, could you output something that would be runnable by the water jet? We're not totally sure, but we're going to look into it to see if we can have a one-stop shop in VCARV to design for any of those machines because it would be really cool. Then you're really just learning one software to get all of those put together. And when you're doing that, another, another piece that you need to keep in mind is sort of machine home, which is based on the machine that you're using, a work home, which is relative to the piece of work that you're doing. So this circle origin right here, or right here, uh, the G code home. So where does that start? Which might be the same as the work home, uh, tooling home, which is where your tool might hang out if it feels like it needs to go to a safe place, which is perhaps where we've all lived for about a year now. But the, but the key is that your machine needs, it also is very helpful for it to have a spot where the spindle can go so that it's not gonna hit anything. And then there's material top and material bottom. A lot of these, if you're doing sort of the normal tool path, you won't need to worry about all of those details. It's just good to keep in mind that those different reference frames are there. And if you say home, on the controls, what is it homing, where is it going to, and which one is it trying to figure out in that moment? They're all important pieces to keep in mind. Uh, but we're gonna first look at easel because this is where people are gonna get into CNC work if you haven't done any of it so far. And so just, I think a quick intro to Inventables, the company is, is worth doing because it gets a little confusing. And if you're watching any woodworking on YouTube, they might be talking about the x -carb, which is the same company. So Inventables, the company, made Easel the software and Easel Pro, and they have several machines that they've made over time. We only have one of these at Makehaven. We have the Shapoko, which was sort of an earlier one of their machines, uh, but Easel has worked well across the entire lineup. So people who stayed in the Inventables ecosystem haven't needed to switch software very much as they go through. Uh, and Easel does a lot of the legwork for you of figuring out all this tool chain. It's interesting. Uh, even You can even use their software to run machines that aren't made by them, which is fascinating too. We might, we might build machines later on that use Easel as their controller. So this is what Easel looks like. This is a design that I've made in the past. You can input nice clean vectors, you know, vector design for a headphone or a circle. And it gives you a little preview of what that might look like. It's handling in the background all of the different pieces and parts that need to happen to go from a design to post-process to G-code. All of that is handled by the machine. And it turns out that Shapokos and X-Carves and Carvey and all of their different versions 
They're all based around the Gerbil firmware, GRBL firmware that you can upload to an Arduino and then an Arduino is in charge of the CNC. So like we talked about last week for outputs, stepper motors are an output that you can have. Essentially, they've got an Arduino and its outputs are the three axes of these machines. So it's just really, you're just using an Arduino when you use the Shapoko, but somebody's written the code already for you so that it can understand when it receives a, G a G code command over the serial port, and then it uses it to move the motors accordingly. So really fundamentally, it's somebody's Arduino project that's been turned into Shapoko and then upgraded and upgraded to get to Carvey and XCarve and XCarve Pro, which is super awesome. I would love to have a conversation with the people at Inventables and talk about all the things that they've done. Uh, it's really cool. But Easel is all in the browser. So you can make an account through Inventables and start playing with it right now. If you wanted to get ready to come in and get badge, you can have a design that you make well before you show up. So it's a really helpful one because you don't need to install anything. You just make an account and go. Uh, it may ask you if you want to install things. That's for the port that will let you plug a machine into your computer. You don't need that if you're just using your personal laptop. We have that installed at Makehaven on the computer that's tied to the Chipoka. So it's a very useful tool. You can also, if you really like the Chipoko and you'd like to make more complicated things than you think you can design within their software, you can design it elsewhere. So this is the start of that piece that I've cut, uh, cut with its design running G code that I've uploaded to Easel. And Easel's pretty friendly about it. It looks for the vectors more than the settings. It knows that it's going to reset all of the settings that you upload. So you don't have to be too particular in the G code that you upload. It's a fairly forgiving process. So if you want to just sort of dip your toes into your own separate cam uh, solutions, you can start to do that design work, maybe in Fusion 360, which is where this came from, upload the G code into Easel and then see what it looks like. And then you can even try cutting it out on the Shapoko if you're interested. It's totally what I did earlier in the late summer when the Gerber wasn't up and running yet. So this is totally something that you can do. Um, you just have to be a little careful about origins and some of those things. But VCard, this is where I think the main star of the show is going to be, although Shipoko and, and Easel are great. I think getting upgraded to VCard is going to be a good move as we make, make our way forward. Ada, it looks like you might be unmuted. Can you mute yourself again? Cool. I was just hearing some feedback, that's all. Okay. All right. So VCarve is a software that I can, I can just pull up right here. I've got it. What I want to do is drag it onto the screen so that you can see sort of what I'm up to. Here is VCarve. This software is super fun to play with. It's got all sorts of details that you can, that you can do. Uh, this is a file that I have open, and basically these are just DXFs that I've imported, and it, it's a little bit broken. I have some overlapping vectors, um, but this software lets you just highlight those things, and then you can make some toolpaths. So you can play around with this to do designs, to do some V-carving, to do all these different things, and this might break. I was trying to fix this before class um, because I just realized I had a problem a few minutes before, but in there, yep, and that's, that's exactly what it's doing. Um, so it's a little bit broken, but it, it works. It solved that problem for me. So in here, VCar will take those vector designs and this is already going through and you can see those blue lines there. Those are the tool paths that, um, that it's calculated. And then one of the great things that VCar will do is it will let you preview all tool paths. So it, We'll do it pretty quick, but you can see that it's it's simulating what would happen if a tool went through and cut that out. So it followed all those blue lines, exactly how it would cut and what it would end up looking like. And this is all done in 3D. Um, so I can rotate around and I can see sort of what the geometry of that looks like. And it's, my computer is like at its edge right now. So it's a slow uh, nudging through the things, but it's able to simulate what that looks like when you do your cut. It's a little easier to say over in 2D view. Um, but in there, you can, you can decide all sorts of different things. This software is broadly speaking, very helpful. And so if we go in here, you can set all kinds of tool paths. Like I want this to be a cutaway. So you can do close and you can, you can do all sorts of stuff. Um, 
And this is, Lior actually just made the video for the Gerber, and he did a phenomenal job, I think, showing all of the ins and outs of VCarve. And he's going to do a better job. It's like a full half hour of just VCarve tutorial, which I might make my own a little bit later in the week. Um, but it's a really good way to see and make sense of what this is and how it works and sort of how you'd work with Makehaven's versions of it to, to make it happen. This is something we'll put in the chat after class. This is a software that you can download and install with a special code that lets you make all of your files ready to, to cut, it, but it won't let you export G-code unless you come into Makehaven and use our specially licensed pieces here. So you can save the files. It will eventually output G-code, but the licensing that we're doing for Makehaven the space is a, is a little wonky. You can download it and install it on your computer save a CRV file and then come to Makehaven and then cut it. You're saying that it does, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. You can choose the tools. All of that is set in here. Like in here you select your tool and then in, in this section you can choose what kind of tool you'd like to do. Like if I wanna use an end mill that's a quarter inch, here's speeds and feeds that are all calculated. There's a whole metric to that. Uh, there's a video that I've got coming up, a slide or two, that'll get to that in a minute. But the, the auto settings are conservative, but not impossible. Like they're, they're not the most aggressive that you could be, but they're also not terrible. Um, they're pretty conservative at 50 inches a minute. You could probably go much faster than that, uh, like at 400 perhaps. Uh, but I would need to do the math before I just say go for it at 400 inches a minute. So there's, there's a lot of subtlety to this, but if you're hesitant, your tools will just burn up a little bit faster if you go with the default settings for tools in Vcard. Um, so those are important details to take into account. So let's hop back over to the slides. The, the interface, I think, is a little bit tricky, so I wanted to make sure that these got up here as viewable, that these are part of the slide. Um, there's no labels. There's tool tips, so if you hover over, you can see. But this is for a circle. I think the transform in the Vcard GUI is a little odd. Um, this is to move something, to scale it, to rotate, to mirror. Uh, this is an important one to close gaps. If you have vectors that you've designed in Fusion 360 as like a DXF, and then you import them into VCarve, oftentimes instead of being, like if you have a circle, instead of drawing a circle, it'll have a series of small line segments. If you use the close gap tool, it will take those lines and group them together. So they become a continuous vector instead of a series of short vectors. It's often the first thing that you wanna do as you're bringing something into uh, VCarve is to close the gaps from a TXF. Then if you're saving and you saw me pull up this for toolpath, there's a lot of different operations that you can do. There's profile or outline and then pocket and then drilling. Uh, VCarve is the namesake design that you can do. It's, it's for use with a V bit. Like I've got a V bit here actually in the room with me. So this is something that's fun. This was cheap. If anybody wants to use this, just let me know. I'd be happy to leave it here for the week, for two, a couple of weeks. Uh, but this tool will let you cut and it changes its width based on the depth that it's cutting. And it's a really cool maneuver that you don't have to figure out because VCarve has done that for you. It's, it's, they've named their software after that feature. Like they're that proud of it. Um, so it's really a cool way to go because as you're cutting in, and I got a block of wood here, as you cut in deeper, right, the width of that cut, and I know I'm probably very small on screen, but as you cut deeper, the width of that opening gets wider. So you can get really nice organic shapes just based on the trig that's happening in there. It's a fun sine, cosine, and tangent problem all the way along if, you, if you're interested in your high school math again. Um, a big thing is the saving is a little bit tricky. This is the part that you have to come into Makehaven to do to save the, the G code out of the file versus saving the overall car file. And I'll make a video showing how that works uh, so you can see it in more detail. But Leor's video is very good. When you're setting up your tools, you'll want to choose your material in VCarve. You'll want to think about your cutting parameters. There's a video here that's also very good about how do you calculate speeds and feeds. In general, when you're thinking about making a new toolpath, you want to follow this tooltip that you click over here in toolpath, that window pops up and tell me do that. But you think about it linearly from top to bottom. And it basically will walk you through the process of setting up toolpath for the things that you want to make. Um, in here, this is where you'd select your tool and you get options based on that. 
naming your, your tool path is often really helpful down here, but then you want to save those things. This Haas tip of the day video is also pretty good. Um, it walks you through the details of getting that set up. Uh, this is in general, oh, that's not even the video. In general, they're going to be focused on machining metals, but the idea still works for wood. I put in the chat just a couple hours ago about somebody who tested machining uh, wood with different speeds and feeds to get different chip loads. So you can sort of see and hear what's going on. When we get to next week, and you've had a little bit of experience with the machine, we're going to talk about listening to the machine as the key marker for how it's going. So you get different sounds out of a CNC, and the more time you spend running one, the better you'll get at hearing what it's doing and hearing if it's going well or if it's going poorly. You want to listen for is it rubbing or is it chattering? Is it shaking? Uh, those sorts of things you listen for in a CNC because usually it's happening too fast for you to see it, to like see it with your eyes. So it's a really interesting skill. As you get better and better in a machine shop, whether it's for wood or for metal, you're going to listen more than you're even looking. Not that you shouldn't look, uh, but you're going to listen to things more, more often. And Kate is totally right. It's the sound is how you know that there's a problem. If it sounds wrong, and it's, it's hard to describe exactly what that is, but if it sounds wrong, you're going to know faster than you're going to be able to see that there's a problem. So it's totally something that you want to keep an eye on or keep an ear out for as you're doing this. Let's see, we'll click on to the next one. So if you are doing this previewing tool path, which is what you saw me do with the button in there, is really an important piece. Uh, and, and just like you said, Anna, there's roughing and finishing passes are absolutely a good way to go. That's what this is a gift of. There's a roughing pass, which is the one that has the sort of step on it. And those roughing passes are really using an aggressive tool, the biggest one you can find, an upcut to remove material to get rid of as much as possible so that all of the material, a lot of the material is gone. And the finishing pass would just be bringing it into that final shape. These are commands that are options inside of vCarve. So you can set up a roughing pass and then a finishing pass to go with it uh, when you have a shape that you're interested in. And this is for full three-dimensional machining. Something that the Gerber is going to be good at, the Carmack is going to be good at, and I have done on the Chipoko. The Chipoko is sort of good at it. It, it does a good job, but you don't want to make sure that you're trying to do precision things with the Chipoko for that. Um, it's definitely sort of wandering out of its power range when you get to that size of work with a Chipoko. But it's, total, it's a good place to start. Um, so in here, you want to think about trying to figure that out. I really like previewing toolpaths because it's got your ability, because it gives you a sense of what the tool is going to do, which is, makes it a little bit safer when you're there. Kate asked a good question, is the Shapoko 2.5D? And that's it's a good question. We're going to talk about 2.5D and 3D CNC machining. Three-dimensional CNCs are where you can move in the X and Y, which is in the X is one dimension, the Y is another dimension, and then the Z is your third dimension. And so the X, Y, and Z, if you can move in all three, that would classify as a 3D, a three-dimensional or three-axis CNC. The Shifoko, because its Z-axis is so underpowered, it's, I think it's more often considered a two-and-a-half-dimensional device. But you can absolutely give it commands to move in all three dimensions. You just need to make sure that it's, it's going much slower in the Z dimension. And these will take care of all of that for you. So I would say that it's fully a 3D, a three-axis CNC. Mm -hmm but I wouldn't push it too hard on the third one, right? Mostly you want to think about two-dimensional things. What the Shapoko is really good at is if you've made a cutting board and you want to cut somebody's name in it, it's fantastic at that. If you want to put a thing in a sign, it's really good at that too. If you want to put some detail on things, you want to put a name in, you want to cut some very intricate shapes that are small and wouldn't take a lot of power, it's really good for that. But once you've figured out the tool chain for the Gerber, I have this strong suspicion that very few of you are going to go back to the Shapoko afterwards. Uh, it, I, it just feels like a one-way trip to me. So it's going to be a thing that we, we make our way through. Uh, I'm excited to see how this develops as we get there. So what are, the, what are the things that could be hiccups as you're doing this, especially if you're trying to explore VCAR? Uh, big ones are these open vectors. This is an example of what's going on here. When you import vectors, they're often not continuous. 
VCARVE works best if those are closed states. So you'll want to use this join vector tool, and I'll put a video together showing you how that works um, if we don't get a minute to play with it here. And then another one is the post processor. If you're doing the Gerber, this is the post processor that you want to use. EMC2, and I like G61. Uh, in the video that Lior did for the Gerber, he used G64. G61 stays true to your design. G64 is maybe a little bit easier on the machine, but marginally different um, because we're dealing with wood and a lot of the time it's going to be different soft wood. So in here, you want to think about your version, but EMC2 is a post processor. When you click on this, it's going to be a very long drop down list, but preloaded somewhere down there will be EMC2. That's the post processor that you need to have selected when you go to save a tool path. This is something that you'll do at Makehaven. And then this is a little bit fiddly, I have to say, when you're saving a tool path. You'll want to make sure that you've got the right one selected in the checkbox, that it's highlighted here, and that it's showing right there. I often like to check this box, but sometimes, for reasons I don't always understand, this won't let you check the box, and then you have to save them one at a time. Uh, eventually, we're going to have a tool changer, and so we'll, then we'll be able to set this up. And I think it's probably, I don't have a tool a tool changer setting check somewhere. But then you'll be able to automatically go from one tool to another on the Gerber. So if you wanted to cut with a roughing pass with one end mill and a finished pass with a different end mill, at some point in the future, that will all be able to happen in one operation on the Gerber. And you won't need to touch it at all in between. We're not there yet. We're like working on getting there, but it's a very exciting thing to look forward to after you've changed tools a few times by hand. You'll be very excited to not have to do that ever again at some point in the future. Um, and so what are the things that are really the, the players for what we should get up onto next? And we're a little bit ahead of time, so we're going to have some time to look at VCAR, which I'm excited about. Uh, what are the next things that we're going to do? If you're thinking about what you'd like to make this week, I want you to think about doing personalizations or patterns. So how do you do designs where you're going to be cutting into, ma into materials, into wood? A lot of the time for your starters, I'd start with plywood or soft wood. What I've done in the past is actually bought two by fours because they're cheap from Home Depot or Lowe's or anywhere that'll sell you a two by four. And I'll cut off the ends so they're flat and glue them together into a panel and use that as a machinable material. But you can also cut into foam or plastics or other materials, especially foam and plastic on the Shipoko is gonna go great. You'll get little staticky flyaways everywhere. Your chips are very annoying when it's plastic and foam, um, but not really problematic. You just build up a lot of static charge. So there's, there's that to think, to think about. Um, but those pieces we, wanted, we want to look at are giving you sort of this goal for patterns or lettering. Like these little desk nameplates, those are always cnc um, when you've got a little cut down into them. Or here's a sign on the back of a boat, I think, where it's using a V-bit to cut into the shape. This is definitely V-bit up here. You've got that tapered edge. That's absolutely how that was made. It looks like this is a sign for some town. Um, this is actually a decoration in the very tall apartment building across the street from May Haven. So in, that, in their lobby, they've got this. This is a sheet of plywood. It's Baltic birch. And all they've done is they've cut in these weird oval designs. And that's it. I'm sure it was a very expensive decoration to put in that lobby. Because it's a high, the rent there is not cheap. I looked it up when I was moving. Um, and so I'm sure they paid a lot for that. And it just makes me warm inside to think all it is is a sheet of plywood that was laid on to a CNC. And that's it. That's all that happened. Um, so doing personalizations and patterns is a great way to get started and totally a valid thing. I have a friend back from Cleveland who, who loves doing this, actually, and he sells it as art. Um, he'll take a sheet of plywood, make just a geometric pattern, and let the CNC take its perfect time cutting it, do whatever it needs to do. And then he fills the whole thing in with a lightly colored resin, sort of a translucent resin. So you still can see the layers of the wood but it's also like glossed over in a colored resin material. It looks really sharp um, and it would definitely sell as a large art installation kind of piece. So there's tons of cool options there. Don't undercut, oh, I'm just making a pattern. It's a completely valid way to make art that will sell for a large pile of money. 
Um, not that that's always our goal, but it's a, it's, I don't want to undercut the value of just making the pattern. Like in, it would essentially be taking this and filling in all those grooves with resin. So there's a ton of cool options there. Um, eventually we're going to get to make something big and that would be where you take a design like down here in the corner from open desk and open desk. You can download these designs. I actually signed up and tried to download this one earlier in the week. Their download section is a little bit offline, but if you followed the make a school example from season 360, you already have the design that you need to cut on a CNC uh, of knockdown school. So you should be able to do that if you follow the, those instructions and you can take your DXF and use it to cut a tool out of a sheet of plywood if you'd like to make it into a real physical object. I've definitely done that many times. It's totally uh, the way to go. We're going to talk about, yes, yeah, and so there's all sorts of wood that's here if you're trying to do decorative wood. This is I just bought this piece of wood from Make Haven. It was two long boards earlier today, um, but this is about an inch thick. It was maybe $8. It's a great way to get started for doing some, some things. We're also going to try and get ourselves some plywood over the next week or so, but we're working on some of the details of that. We'll get some more information coming up. Uh, but the pieces of wood in the back for Make Haven, if you're looking for something to source, you can get a board for less than $10 easily. So there's a ton of wood that's there. Cutting it, remembering sort of your wood shop skills of squaring it with the jointer and then a planer maybe, uh, gluing it up into a panel, those sorts of things, they're, they're totally the way to go. So you can absolutely get started with nice projects like this without too much too much difficulty. And it feels great to start in the wood shop doing wood shop things that are nice and hands-on. Uh, so getting badged on these are, are definitely sort of the next step. So in any case, one day we're going to make something big. I am sorry that that slide made noises. Uh, that was weird. The three, so what we're going to go over next week, the goal, the game plan is to do three axis CNC design, sort of what that looks like, differentiate it from two and a half D designs. The table that was up there squealing at you, again, sorry, uh, that was a two and a half D design. All of those cuts were just across the sheet of plywood. I never changed the depth of the cutter. They were just cutting a thing out. And so that I would classify as a two and a half D design. Using two dimensional panels to make something that's 3D is sort of where the, the name two and a half D comes from. And then we're going to talk about dog bones and end mills a little bit more. We're, we're back. We're on Jamie's computer and hopefully it doesn't sound terrible. Okay, great. I feel like it's show and tell time. Can I ask one question before we get into show and tell? Yeah. I, I still feel like I'm a little confused about V-Carve versus easel. Oh, is, yeah. Is V-Carve basically just one that you could use for all of them, like that you could use for the uh, Gerber? Yeah. So you could also V-Carve for the Shapoko. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so easel is an inventables product that's for the Shapoko. And, and you can go beyond, but at Make Haven, it's easiest to think that easel is for the Shapoko here at the end. Um, we might mess with that later, but it's good to keep it there. Whereas V-Carve is made by a company that's Vectric, I think is the company name. And V-Carve is a product that lets you run many, many different CNCs. Like I've used it for the Gerber. I've used it for a ShopBot. I've used it for lots of different machines on different platforms. And so V-Carve is sort of a generic one that'll let you export and do design work with different tools and end mills and think about speeds and feeds so that you can use it more generally. So that, that's the difference. Um, we're excited about VCarve as being an option for being able to design and then use that on any number of machines. So in, in theory, you can, and there is a post-processor for the Shapoko. You could design in VCarve and run it on the Shapoko. Um, you could design in VCarve, run it on the Gerber, or you could design in VCarve, and we think you can run it on the Tormac also. So we haven't actually done that yet, but it, it could be a cool thing to explore. So like Inkscape gets used for both the laser and the vinyl cutter, VCarve would be for all of those machines, sort of a one-stop shop. There are other ways to do it, um, and we'll explore that more next week. We're going to do Fusion 360 Cam next week, but VCarve is sort of the, if you wanted to, if you have done easel and you want to move past it, 
the thing to try this week would definitely be V card. So yeah, cool. Um, all right. So next up with, with any other questions, cause there's a lot that got covered. One of the things that might be fun to do is I might connect to the meeting at some point after the show and tell, and then we can go point at things in the room to sort of identify what's there and what's going on with these different machines might end up veering a little long, but let's do show and tell to hear about what happened to this week from people. And we've got two people in the room. Would either of you like to tell us about your week? Sure. I took my project apart. Um, I finally got my alarm working. Um, I was going to attach a servo to it to pull another mechanical alarm. Scratch that idea. But this is basically just showing the different sensors like the photoresistor, the ultrasonic sensor, which is both an input and output sensor, uh, and the PIR sensor. And what else? Oh, and a tw tilt switch so that if someone knocks something or whatever, it would uh, go off. Plus, I want to use capacitive touch so that if part of the door or something is touched, that would also set it off. Um, but in the meantime, I got the code working flawlessly. Everything, all these sensors integrate into it nicely. It, it runs well. I tried it out on the serial, serial monitor and it's great. And within all this, it wasn't the most exciting thing to make. It wasn't beautiful. It's not where I want to stop with this, but I really want to learn the concepts of all these sensors plus the embedded coding and to make these all work together well. And so I feel like what I took away from it was really valuable. It doesn't look great. Um, and I do want to, during this course, make something that is more beautiful, like a, you know, a flower that opens up, like I showed you folks that, you know, lights up. But in the meantime, I just kind of use the last two weeks to really deep dive into physics and that the math of it, how the speed of sound works with the ultrasonic sensor, um, how the, the lenses and how the PIR works. Um, so yeah, that's what I did. You said it was it wasn't pretty, but can we see what it looks like at all? I'm just oh, kidding. Sure. I'm, oh. I'm sorry. I thought I, I showed it. Um, let me get this up again. Uh, and I'm using the tilt, tilt switch uh, for the resistor there. Um, there's the ultrasonic sensor and the PIR. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There's, there's a ton of cool stuff. That was a neat project to see. It was all totally just live on a breadboard. And the transition is to think about how to solder it in place, put it in an enclosure. This sort of thing. Cool. All right. Uh, anybody else want to tell us what you've been up to this past week? Sure. Yeah. So um, I don't know why, but like I've always looked at motors and been like, no, like I could never understand you. If I tried, it would, I don't know if I'd ever come back. If, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully someone sort of knows what I'm getting at. I had a ton of fun working uh, just with this, this uh, stepper motor. Um, servo, and yeah. what's that? That's a servo. Yeah. Um, this is a servo. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, I, I really want to um, think about making a clock, uh, mm. even if it doesn't actually tell time, just like a goofy clock, a completely useless clock would be, um, would be great. And I, I think um, 
part of what I'm like thinking about is how fun it might be just to like, I, I'm thinking about a lot of things, but maybe if I could use the CNC machines to like carve out um, channels for magnets, I'd love to be able to swap in and out like magnet panels. So uh -huh. I can be like, oh, like today I want to cook and I want to like do this and I can just arbitrarily put these little magnetized like things that I have planned um, on the clock. And then once the, like the arm gets there, like I'll do that. I don't know, something like that. Um, <laughs> but it works. Uh, and I did it first thing this morning. I just like woke up and was like, I will not have coffee until I figure this out. So that was a good <laughs> motivator. Um, I mean, I could plug it in, but I mean, like, you know what it does, it, it does work. So, and using the new, uh, the new mega board was kind of cool too. I mean, very much like the Uno, um, Nothing, nothing really like majorly different that I could tell, but uh, it was fun, and I, I feel like this will lead me to some other really cool stuff. I look forward to playing around with the brush motor and a couple of the other stuff in the kit that I got soon. Yeah, there it's there's tons of possibility with all of those different things, and you can make them go whichever way you want. There's it would be awesome to have a clock that's like here's where the this is where lunch is. This yeah. Is, this is where I'm going to... I mean, it all bleeds together anyway. Like, I, I would like the... I, I kind of dig the idea of... Almost like when you had periods in high school, you mm -hmm. know? Like, I'm kind of going to... Like, I'm going to do this thing around this time and just, like, leave it at that. I yeah. think that would be, like, a, a radical destructuring of of, uh, of my world. So or Even, like, I'm imagining, like, an arc that covers an area, and you're like, I'm going to work while it's in this arc. And then once oh, it's like over, that. like, I'm done. I like that. I like, like that. that, like a radial sort of like. I yeah. like that. That's cool. Huh. Would be fun. Plus, then you can with the with the control, you can make the like once you pass a certain point, the hands just go nuts. <laughs> I yeah. can hook it up to a camera and live stream it to my coworkers so they can know when I'm finished for the day. <laughs> that yeah. sounds like a blast. We'll see if that works. Anyway, yeah. yeah, it was it was great. I um, I I'm really excited about playing around with more motors. Yeah, cool. All right, well, got it. You are unmuted. You want to go? Yeah, yeah. Let me jump in. Uh, I will do a screen share here. Uh, let's get back onto the Zoom. Let's see. I think that's it. Yes, it is. All right. So I'll just step through some pictures and video here. So I got this um, little care package on Thursday. It took almost a week to get uh, from SparkFun. But from what you can see here, it's just a bunch of different gadgets in there. Um, ultrasonic sensor. Uh, I have a stepper motor in there, but I didn't really get to play with it this week. Uh, Are LiDAR. Showing, you might be showing us the file folder instead of the photos. Oh, uh, yeah. Let's change that. Okay. We are new share. And yeah. I will do this. Okay. There it is. You see it now? Yep. Got it. Okay. Excellent. So yeah, so this is the stuff uh, that I got. I just bought a, a bunch of random stuff in case I want to try it out, play with it later. Uh, so what I decided to focus on was uh, grippers. So I had a few, uh, but then I found uh, as I was cleaning up uh, during the winter break, uh, an old quad bot that I had uh hmm. it was that was gifted um probably like 10 years ago uh but uh it had, really was just sitting around collecting dust uh so i even had the manual with it uh so from what you can see in this picture there's eight servo motors on it and i was kind of skeptical if it would work um uh, and so each leg has two servo motors uh, yeah. that twists around and then bends. Uh, so, and there's also several holes for attachment here. So I just thought, okay, well, why don't I just try it out? 
uh, for this week. So uh, I put I, this is a uh, micro uh, Arduino. I tried really hard to push into this board. Uh, the pins were pretty <laughs> hard to get in, so I used a bunch of headers uh, to kind of loosen up those pins so I can eventually push that in. Uh, this was the hookup uh, that I had uh, originally. And this was just based off the pinout diagram on the physical pins. Uh, so I got that all hooked up on there. And uh, I have a video. <laughs> so as you could see, uh, it wasn't really working too well, so um, I was a bit disappointed, so I did some investigation. Uh, let me pause that, uh, find out what was going on. Uh, so I tried uh, individual legs originally uh, with the, uh, the micro. I'm not sure what was going on here, uh, but you hear that chatter. Uh, so I wasn't getting anywhere with that. Um, and so what I did is I, I, I downloaded the servo um, program uh, built into Arduino to test that. Yeah. So I decided to, to, to use an Uno instead uh, to test it out. And so as you can see, the leg was working okay. So I wanted to speed it up a little bit. So I thought, okay, why don't I hook it up to a rail and do it two at a time? And so that one worked. I wanted to speed it up a little more. So I said, why don't I get it uh, four pins uh, output and try half the quad bot and see if that works. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a bit jittery, but it, it worked. Uh, and then I tried the other side. It kept getting stuck on that hole there, as you can see. Uh, so I didn't play around with the range too much um, within the program. By the way, I found I found this uh, th 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 I found this code. Uh, there used to be a company that made this, and so uh, I found this this code from. Um, some hobbyist um, over in Australia because the company went defunct like in 2015. So um, let's see. So what I found out from that was I had to change the physical pins into digital output pins for it to uh, detect the servos. And um, this was the final product. Oops. Looks so, like, yeah, <laughs> a little lopsided, but it's it's yeah. a few more tweak, a few more tweaks. I yeah, think, or, yeah you're really like at a point where it's time to start thinking about cable management and machine balancing and all those things. Like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so yeah, that's 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 what I got done. Yeah, that's a that's a ton, Wagata. Um, <laughs> one of the yeah, great job. One of the oh, things thanks. that's really cool um, for next steps, you're trying to make that a little guy that climbs around, is to start to think about, um, first off, is managing those cables. So, like, routing them back through where there's hinges so that they don't have a lot of, so they're pretty stable, but they have some give where they need to bend. And so thinking strategically about how to wrap those through the body. Yeah, um, yeah. And then that, that, that was kind of hard too. I didn't have, yeah. any, I didn't have any rubber bands around. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's tricky. Like the cable management and moving robots is not as easy as you hope. And then the other piece is um, to start to think about how do you want, like practice what you want one leg motion to be and, like code that for the two servos together so that you have a function that's like step forward and then you can just make it go through step forward actions each one of the motors like yeah, writing it yeah. in a clever way 
if the code doesn't exist for you so that each step is like its own little thing. You say, I want you to walk forward four steps and it just does it. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I, I'll definitely bring it in and, cool. you know, maybe, maybe uh, you know, we can, you could help out with that or anybody yeah, else that wants fun. to play around with it too. Yeah. Good Thanks. Fun. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't hear you. Oh, wow. Did the code, like, did, did the embedded code come with that kit? Was it, like, was it easily integrated into it, or did you have to develop your own, and how did you? Uh, it, you yeah, so, yeah. so the, you know, like, I got it, like, 10 years ago, and the company, like, went, you know, went out back in 2015. So I found, <laughs> it took me a while to dig for the code, but I found the code from some hobbyist out in Australia, and so uh, <laughs> he, he happened to have had uh, the software and uh, that I needed. And um, th there's like two versions, a slow version and a fast version. So that was a slow version. Uh, but, you know, you, you can modify it uh, any range that you want, the amount of time that you want it to take uh, within the code once you have it and stuff. Did you play around with it and like just experiment or? Yeah, yeah. I, I did like the range a little bit. Uh, trying that out. Um, that's kind of how you got the leg that drops down on the side. If you, if you saw that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I have to try that out a little more, mess around with that a little more uh, with the timing so that it can like, you know, scramble across the room. Yeah. So. It, it reminded me of how a tardigrade moves. <laughs> about two, about uh, two more pairs of legs. <laughs> yeah. It would have been there. Yeah. Thanks. Awesome. All right, let's see. Anybody else? Uh, let's see, who, who would be next? We've got uh, Lila, you want to go? I saw some red glow. As... Oh, I can't hear you. I'm trying to decide if it's me or you. You're not muted, but we can't hear you, Lila. No, nothing. Microphones are not our friends tonight. Yeah, you'd think after a whole year of pandemic, we'd be good at Zoom. <laughs> but here we are. Yeah, maybe Zoom updated underneath all of us. Okay, cool. Lila's going to take care of business. Somebody else want to share what you did this week? Yeah, what's up, Ruby? Oh, yeah, I just, we just lost Ruby. Did that work for me? Uh, that works for Lila. <laughs> Should I go? Yeah, go. Go. <laughs> all right. Um, so the light is from, oh, let's see if I can hold off all this junk. I mean, beautiful motor. So the light is from the chip that holds the motor. Mm. And it's kind of going, is that normal for it to yeah. be having a little disco? Yeah, that's totally normal. All right. So I hooked up the motor to a little, uh, can you see that? Yeah, a little oh. joystick. Yeah. So I just put a little flag on it. And when I do it, can you see it go, wee? <laughs> yeah. That's all. that's all I did. No, but that's, you know, you say that's all, like it's a little thing, but it really, you've connected, like, think yeah. about conceptually what just happened. You took an input, routed it through the Arduino, and then spit it into an output. So you do one thing and it responds to you. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's wizardry. That's yeah, what it it's is. something little. It didn't take long to do, but I accomplished something that it was sure related. Did. And like, I have to say, like the Arduino, when I go to think about it, it's been a big part of this course, but it, it like, it really, it, it takes a lot for me to take some interest in it. So this is, this is good. Yeah. We're, <laughs> we're like, in terms of the Arduino and it being a big part of the course, we are hitting a point where the, the amount of time that's dedicated to Arduino, the sun is setting on that section. So it'll still be there and people who love it can still use it all the time. But we're going to hit some areas that are a little bit more hands-on again, more more design and build, which is right. probably probably yeah. good. All right, next. 
Cool. Ruby, did you get your sound going? Yeah, you want to try the sound, Ruby? Oh, no. Uh, no, I think it, I don't know what it is. Uh, Kate or Anna want to tell us what's up? I can tell you the very little that is is up. Um, sure, yeah. So, as long as I've got sound. Um, so here's my sensor that arrived today. <laughs> so <laughs> I look forward to using it. Um, got it in the mail when I got home from Make Haven today. Um, but so while waiting for this, I was playing around with the CNC um, just to make sure that it was all ready for all of you, which as you heard, I'm, I guess I'm glad I did because it was about to not be but it seems to be better now. Um, but I did do a little post on um, my experience with the Shapoko this week that I can share with you guys if you think that would be helpful as you move into it. Um, yeah, I think that would be helpful. Why not? Okay, let's see if I can yeah. share everything. Whoa. I also am without uh, my computer right now, it's away. So I'm on an older computer that is pretty slow going. Are you seeing this? We're seeing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this week I tried to make a thing and instead what I mostly made was um, um, some hacks and tricks when it comes to the Shipoko. Um, so here are just a few problem areas that I hit in case um, you hit them. Um, the first is a known error for me, which is the bit um, I have a hard time when things are upside down, like the drill press and, and the Shapoko, when it becomes lefty tidy, righty loosey, it like does not compute in my head. Um, but I did work with Lior a little bit today and there's also a lot of buttons. I feel like you need more digits than I have in order to, to change the bit. Um, I would recommend using the, the, looking at the actual router that's like over on the power tools table um, to get a feel for how the bits, um, how the, the, the knobs come out and hold each, the, the pieces in. Um, that, that helps me a lot. Um, so that was minor. The material thickness um, was weird. I've talked with Corey a little bit about this. So you can see my material here was 0.2 inches. Um, and here are some tests over here where even at 0.3 inches, it was not cutting all the way through. Um, I had to go to 0.35 um, and today I was using half inch and I had to actually tell the machine that I was using inch thick to get it through. Um, a lot of different, you, you can see here um, on one of my tests, basically what was happening is I was dealing with a warped board, hence the, mm. the planar jointer recommendation. Um, so even though it was clamped down really securely on the sides, in the center it would still bow. So you can see that it's not on the bottom there, which is not what you want. So my advice in this um, would be like clamp the hell out of it and be aware of that. Um, and also to do tests like I did with this, this just this little star cut um, to test a few points in your, in your material if you can to see what depth it, you're actually getting. Um, the other thing is um, losing connection, which I'm hoping the new driver we're installing is going to remedy, but apparently this was also a known issue with the Shipoko, um, other Woodshop users tell me. And um, what can happen is you get everything all set and then you hit carve and it just sits there. And it's like, it's lost the connection. It'll no longer jog the machine. It won't do anything. It feels like you have no idea what you're doing. The solution to this, interestingly, I learned is to just close Chrome and reopen it. Um, and then it will reconnect. So keep that in the back of your mind. Um, it did happen to me here, if, you, if this will work. Um, you can see we're going along great in my little time lapse. And then it just stops in the middle of my cut. And this is me going over and messing with it and getting it fixed. Um, and I did get it to restart. But um, just to keep that in mind that um, when this happens, if this happens, that's the trick to, to change it. And what I actually did was I raised the tool up, I turned the spindle off, raised the tool up, um, and then restarted the cut from the last home position, which is an option it still gives you even after it has, you've left Chrome and come back if you're leaving and going right back, um, and it was able to do it. So um, this is the first um, Shapoko project I did from 2019. I haven't used it a ton, but this was, you know, not, not much in the meantime. Um, but this is just remembering the first project. The verdict is I still love the Shapoko um, and I want to try to cut some plastic. So that's, that's my goal for this week. Cool. And, and actually, can you go back up? You had some great photos in there. Okay. Kate. 
Going back. Uh, sorry. <laughs> the, um, like I really loved, I can tell that you were using an upcut bit just from the way that it, it flooped on there. So like you can see all the fuzzies on the top. That's totally an upcut bit that was used to do that because the chips would have been spiraled upwards and like those fibers on the very top edge of that plywood, they spun upwards, which is why you've got that curl. If it was a down cut, those, those little swirls on there by your 0.3 star, they would totally be gone. They'd be cut down and away. Um, so that's really the difference. A down cut will cut that downwards. It builds up heat and probably the Shapoko, it's, it's not a good idea to use a down cut just because of that. Um, and then board warping is absolutely something that's going to be an issue that people run into. You'd like to imagine, especially with plywood, that it's perfectly flat, a magical material made by humans, not by trees. Um, but that's not close to what it is. It's, it's going to warp over time. Um, it's, it's got that irregularity. And then in the case of the Shapoko, you can see the bed isn't even flat. So one of the things that I saw when talking with Kate is like, the bed, when you push on it, you can see it deflected downward. And when the bit is making its cut, it's pushing it downward. So if it has a gap beneath the wood, then you've got that down area that it can push into. And then even compounding it further, you can have problems with the whole tool. I don't think that's what's going on with the Shapoko. I think it's a combo of warped material and the bed at this point might need resurfaced. It's probably that time to think about doing that. Maybe we'll, once we get past this unit, we'll resurface that bed. But um, those are all factors that you'll want to take into account for things things that could go wrong that aren't software problems. They're just like the, the reality of using a tool like this. Um, so hopefully those are all things that will be minor hiccups as we go. But yeah, that's awesome, Kate. Very helpful. Is there a minimum thickness uh, plywood that you use on, on the, sh the Shepioko? I mean, like... Um... It's obviously not like as thin as a laser cutter, but like uh Um I I would think that you can go about as thin as you'd like. The thickness is really where you're gonna have a hard time. So the thicker it is, the more that you're burdening the, the tool as it sort of scoops out material. There's only so much chip load is the term for that when you're calculating feeds and speeds if you wanted to get into the calculating, which is which is definitely more of e car task than an easel one uh, but you can only have so much depth per pass the minimum is probably go as low as you'd want um, but when it gets real thin then you're dealing more with wobbly materials and stuff moves on you so you you kind of want some rigidity i would say on the shapoko i would want to do a quarter inch or higher if it's less than a quarter inch it's probably a laser cut task if i have the option you know if i since you have all these machines at your disposal now if it's less than a quarter inch, I'm going to cut it on the laser. If it's a quarter inch or more, I'm thinking Shapoko or Gerber for cutting through material. Okay. And then the other one thing that I will will add, just because you'll hear a lot of pronunciations, <laughs> um, and I actually wrote to Inventables a couple years ago because we had a lot of different pronunciations, and according to them, it is called a Shapoko. I've heard Shapeoko, Shapeyoko, a lot of different things. That's how they say it. If you care. Oh, Shapoko. It's spelled Shapioko, though. Yes, exactly. And a lot of, I've heard <laughs> Shapoko a lot, too, which is why we decided to write them, just because why not? I like the uh, Shapoko No. Yes. Of the title of your video. Yeah. No, that, was, that was my experience. All right. We're going to hold on a second. We're going to try here. Um, if you're talking uh, and you can't do it on the laser, I would probably like do it on the Gerber, but do it do it on top of a piece that you surface so you know that it's flat and rigid and then put that on top and then zero it out again. That's what I would do. Okay, so based on the thickness of that, clamp the edges uh, to get that uh, yeah. uh, to, to get that fixed because you I can't hear. Oh, yeah, you'd want to go you want to think about getting a material that's like a backer. So if you wanted a really thin material, like a sheet of metal, and you wanted to cut it, maybe, and I think we're going to generally say don't cut metal on the Gerber is the make haven rule, even though you probably could, um, just for the sake of metal chips not flying everywhere. 
uh, you'd, you'd lay a, a sheet of plywood or MDF surface the top of that. So, you know, it's perfectly flat relative to the machine because the machine just cut the top flat. Then you put the thin material on top of that so that it's, um, so that it, it's flat relative to where the machine's going to cut. So that you're not dealing with thicknesses in case you wanted to etch the surface or something. Okay. Got it. Yeah. And yeah, it's sort of like metal in the metal shop, wood in the wood shop. Not quite. I think the big thing is they want to minimize the material that can be going. One of the important pieces that this has brought me back to that I wanted to make sure we covered and then the Zoom issue threw me off was safety. When you're dealing with all of these machines, the Shapoko is a relatively safe machine. It's a router that you can turn off and turn on and like it can break and things can happen. But the worst that's going to happen is the spindle falls over uh, as long as you keep your hands away from the machine while it's running. Whereas the Gerber is much larger and much more powerful. We're going to put up like line barriers around it so that you can't walk into its area while it's running. Uh, because the Gerber has enough force in it that it can do a lot of damage. And it, I don't want to get graphic here, but just suffice it to say, like losing a finger is possible uh, of, among many things. You want to keep hair tied back. You want to not have loose clothing. You want to make sure that you, if the machine is moving, you're away from it, that you hit an e-stop when you go to change a tool, uh, all of which Lior goes over in the badging video, and you can watch him uh, tell you about those things. But make sure that as you're using the Gerber, part of the excitement is that it's big and able to do things, is you want to you wanna also make sure that you're very taken care of. Yeah, hoodie strings are a big deal. You can be leaning down and not know where they're at. Tuck them in if you're wearing a hoodie, for sure. I actually changed my shirt today to a zipper one because <laughs> I was going to be on the Shapoko. Yeah. Also, like... Pretty much no, ma no matter what material you have in the wood shop, like e even if the bit is not spinning right or you're trying to shut something down, it, if, that mach if the machine gets the code to like go right through something, uh, it's just going to go right through it. Yeah. yeah um, okay. And yeah. like if it runs into something, it's not like the Shapoko wouldn't. Oh, you're breaking up uh, a bit, Ada. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. It, the Shapoko doesn't have nearly as much force behind its motors. So if, let's say, hypothetically, something terrible happens with the Shapoko, it'll run into an end and stop. Like, it'll bump into the side and the motor can't do any more. Whereas for the Gerber, the motor will just keep going. Um, there, there are stops on its ends where it should stop. But if the motor is just cruising and if you have it at top speed and it's going at 600 inches a minute, 600 inches a minute is fast. Uh, and it can absolutely run into itself and damage itself in a way that is problematic. So there's a lot of, it's like a high risk, high reward kind of machine. Or, it, or, or your workpiece. Like if you're, even if your spindle isn't spinning, if the G code gets configured wrong, it can just drive the spindle down into the piece of wood or whatever it is that you're cutting. So those those forces can really, and and like you don't want to even imagine what that does to a person whose hands in the way. The the key is that for the Gerber, you need to make sure that you're conscious of what's what's going on, what the code's going to do. A thing that Lior pointed out in his video that I really actually like and would strongly encourage is totally run your G code in the air before you do your first cut. And if you'd like me to be here for running the Gerber, I'd be just let me know. I'm happy to come in. Uh, it's not like in a pandemic, there's many other plans, but I'd be happy to be here to help you make it run, make it happen. The And then they're also badging facilitators right now. So there are going to be facilitators in the wood shop who, are bad, who can badge you on the Gerber, uh, who've been trained this week. So... Your first run, probably cutting air is a good idea where you Z or where you touch off the tool where there's no material and you just have it cut in the middle of nowhere. And then getting it to cut into material is its own game. It's very exciting. It's very amazing what you can get to come out of those machines. But I just want to make sure that even though I'm going to offload the like most gruesome details to Lior, 
it's something that you also have to treat with with real respect because it can hurt itself and it can hurt you if you don't do it well. Corey, when you talk about um, running it, oh, I'm sorry, Ada, were you saying something? Oh, we can't hear you, Ada. You gotta be alive. Uh, and uh, even if your spindle is not spinning, like in addition to a... Or maybe center, head, center of the camera on you, uh, I think. Oh. It would be, there it goes. Um, in addition to what Corey said about, like, the spindle going down, you, even if it's not spinning, if it is, like, the level of the work piece and it's not spinning at all, but it just gets a G-code to move sideways and that happens to be into the work piece, it will ram through the work piece or it, like it will can like go right through and break your work piece and break the bit, the tool. Um, so, like it's so, not going to stop. How sensitive is it? Can it go like millimeters or something like that? Um, it, it, it goes it, ten thousandths of an inch. A tenth, uh, so it, or a ten thousand. So it, it's that's precision. it, huh? Yeah. It's really accurate. Um, I'm thinking about trying to use it to make circuit boards, although I might use the Tormac for that just to see sort of how that goes. There's, it's, it's amazing the level of precision that you can get on the Gerber. It's going to get like the Shapoko is great. I've actually tried to make a circuit board on the Shapoko and it has too much run out. The, the axle, the spindle will wobble a little bit. In like a normal thing, if you're cutting lettering on a sign, you're doing lots of big things, it, it doesn't matter. But if you're trying to cut a circuit board where the traces are very small and you can imagine sort of the soldering size of things, that's too much detail for the Shapoko. The Gerber might actually have the resolution where it can pretty much do that. The Tormac definitely will. So there's different levels of precision that you get with different machines. Um, and basically, it maps to their price, like how precise they are effectively. So you've got those pieces to take into account. But the Gerber, for lots and lots and lots of woodworking projects, will have more than enough precision uh, to you than, than you'll need for most woodworking projects. Also, Kate's totally right. The Shapoko is a prerequisite badge for the Gerber. So if you are already badged on the Shapoko, you could go for the Gerber. But if you're not, you need to do Shapoko first. It's definitely... And, and I think that's totally the right call because the Gerber's got a new badge, but because sort of it's the low stakes game, right? It's playing T-ball before you get to the baseball team, right? That's, that's what it is. Um, so playing with the Shapoko is, is going to show you all the different skills. You zero things out, you home the axis, uh, and it's a good place to get started. Because your work is smaller, like everything's smaller, the motors are lower power. It still can do a ton of stuff that's really cool, like Kate's uh, thing to hold cups, or I made a phone stand or a headphone stand. There's a bunch of good options with the Shipoko. I don't want to discredit it at all. Like I said, those detailed artistic patterns can be really exciting, but you've got to make sure that you're you're keeping it uh, that you're thinking about like what could go wrong that on the Gerber would be a higher stakes event. It's like an hour. Oh, what's that? When you talked about, um, you know, air printing or whatever, you know, going going up and doing that, you could do that with a Shapoko as well, right? You would just set the home, yep. you know, two inches up. Yes, and you totally can practice it with a Shapoko before you do it with the Gerber so that you just cut, like, if your material starts here, and you can find your X and Y, but then you just say that the material really starts here. You know, if it's three quarters of an inch material, start an inch above it. So that when it does its cut, all of it is in the air right over the material. So you get a sense for like, is it going to cut? Like, is it going to fit on the material that you have? Have you clamped it in the right area? Is it going to work? Would you hit a clamp? Would you hit a metal part of a clamp? All of those things that are important to think about, you can, you can test by testing it in the air. Uh, One thing that I didn't put in my blog post that you reminded me of that I meant to, um, that Corey and I talked about as far as troubleshooting goes with the Shapoko, is um, that that 30 inch black box. Oh, yeah. um, it, the bottom line is hardest to see down at the at the very bottom. It's kind of faded. But if you scoot that, if you scoot the Shapoko outside of that box, it 
thoroughly confuses it. It sometimes disconnects, it changes its home, it just gets completely confused. So pay attention to those lines um, and, and don't go outside them because not only is that, you know, it says does not cut outside this area, but it also really confuses the machine. And so it'll mess up your work. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's, maybe a future me with lots of time should like build up walls so that it bumps into walls there and can't like physically go there. But that's, that sounds like a thing to do when there's many extra hours. Um, yeah, the, or, or lasers to stop it. That would be fun. Yeah, there's, there's tons of good options. All right, uh, let's see. Ruby, does your, do we wanna try your sound again? No, nope, you're, you're, you're muted on the call, but the call is there. You gotta unmute on the call. You're unmuted. Hi, Hi. yeah. Okay, all right. I don't know what's happening. I called in um, and I like tried to fix my audio, like test it and it's not recognizing it. I'm gonna ignore it because um, I'm gonna hope that solves it by its own. Um, today, or this week, I uh, honestly didn't have as much time as I wanted to um, but I decided to work on, on, on my website and make a Google site or a, a, yeah, a new website so I can document my projects in a more organized way. And I've been thinking about like what exactly it is that I, I, I want more out of my website, I guess is, is the issue. I don't want to just like list it out and like put, like put it this way. I use a notebook. And I write down everything that I want to understand and I'm trying to understand at every class. And I have those like scattered in like four different notebooks and it's totally unorganized and I reference it back and it, it just makes it harder to try to remember things. I want, I want this website to sort of work as that notebook in a, in a sense. Um, and it, it, I don't know, that, that, that's my concept. And I think that's what I've been trying to get at and why it's been so frustrating for me to it to have that on my personal like website. So um, let me share my screen. Um, this is what I made. Um, and it's like, I kind of just lay it out like this is for me, this is yeah, not for anybody right. else, I think. Yes. So very simple, very straightforward picture of me. And then links to like, it's not finished, but links to like um, each piece. And then I kind of just ripped everything from like the old website, um, the text. And I basically have written out like how I want to organize this for, for myself to be able to reference. And I, I want to be able to use this as I am making the things, you know, like, um, if that makes, I hope that makes sense. Yeah, um, like an go. active, like, like an active notebook. Um, yeah. I need, I need something to, to help me like stay grounded. Like when I'm trying to figure it out, like on my own. So I made a list of like what I have done and projects that I haven't been able to finish for whatever reason. Um, and I'm sort of like sorting through and like, I'm gonna, you know, write it out and kind of, I'm pretty much starting from scratch. That's, that's how it feels, but I don't think, um, I think it's necessary. And so it's, it's, it's been a little bit of a, uh, I don't know the word. It's not difficult, it's just a bit tedious in a, in a, in a really good way, you know, like kind of readjusting and like, yeah, so yeah. it's not as much as I wanted to get done this week, but it is, it is, it is definitely very transparent, very honestly where I'm at right now. Um, that's that's awesome, yeah. Ruby. It looks it looks great. Um, I think it's I think that's a pro move. We're gonna one of the things that was also on my docket to talk about is the wild card weeks coming up, and this feels like a great a great way to make things work, especially in maybe a wild card week sort of area. I feel like you've laid the roadmap out for lots of us to see sort of what's next. Ooh, 
Thank you. Yeah. So the, the website looks okay. brilliant, and I'm excited to see how it goes. Let me know. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Um, you also are getting, yeah, what a good way to use time. When you got limited time, sometimes it's hard to get in, and it's a good way to do it. Um, all right. And so then we've got... Anna, did you what, did you get in? Get able to do anything? I don't you know if you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Uh, I I went in last week and got badged on uh, the three D printers and the Formlabs printer, not the Mark Forge because there wasn't time. But I I already took the test for the Mark Forge, so I just have to go back. Um, and then I also got badged on the Shapoko. Um, but, um, yeah, like I, I thought I wanted to make something that would hold my iPad, but I don't, <laughs> like, I have no idea, like, if that's what I really want to do. I think I just need to cut a hole in a board and then yeah. move on from there. Some, sometimes you just cut a hole in a board to, like, do it in a new way, right? If you've never used a yeah. hole saw, that's a great strategy. Or on the scene, on the Shapoko, like yeah. cutting out a star is a great way to get started. It doesn't need to be a fantastical thing that that is very useful at the start. And don't, I don't want anybody to feel a lot of pressure, especially as we go into a whole new realm of like 3D, think, 3D thinking and 3D making. You gotta give yourself the latitude that you're just exploring these ideas. You're not gonna crank out and make a piece of fine art on week one. Yeah, so uh, I don't know what I'm gonna carve. I mean, I don't know what I'm gonna cut into. I have no idea. Uh, I don't have a lot of access to a lot of materials, so I'll probably just cut into a piece of acrylic and I gotta figure out the best bit for that and what I want and yeah, so I don't know. A good, um, a good resource is the scrap bin in the back room and the there's there's like a scrap pile with different widths of stuff and just totally go and like if you're really unsure about what you want to make for everybody just grab something out of the scrap bin and cut back like it doesn't need to be anything fancy it's just a good way to get your your foot in the door to research and like play around and and just get started there's not a lot of straight stuff back there and there's not a lot of stuff that's thicker than eighth of an inch so there's oh. like one piece of MDF back there that's like maybe a quarter inch. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it's it's like I, I spent a fair amount of time when I was in there badging the Shapoko trying to find something that would work. Oh, yeah. And it's all very thin and not flat. So you mm -hmm. definitely need to use the planer joiner. Gotcha. Yeah. No, that planer joiner is a good way to start. Even if you're just getting yourself staged, like there's, there's plenty of good reason to try different things. Maybe I'll try and get some foam. Even even like a styrofoam is a good one to cut. Honestly, like it's not unsatisfying to cut cardboard on the Shapoko. It's a little weird. Don't get me wrong, but you can cut cardboard on the Shapoko and it goes it goes oddly well. Um, uh, how does it not catch fire? Well, you, you go nice and slow. Um, it's well, or yeah, 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 actually it's faster. You go, you go faster so that you're moving past and heat doesn't build up. Um, okay. So you want to make sure that as the bit goes, you want to choose the most aggressive speeds that you can, the most aggressive feed rates that you can get so that the bit isn't rubbing. One of the big reasons why tools in general build heat is because they're going too slow through a material. They're spinning more than they're headed forward. There's a perfect magical combo for each tool. And if you buy a tool from a specific, from like a official retailer, they'll tell you exactly what combo of speed for spin and feed for length to go. Okay. And if you're trying to cut cardboard, the best way to do it is to avoid heat is just to like almost tear through it. The, the cut is more or less ceremonial. You just want to zip through as much as you can. Okay. Yeah. So, yep. So let's see. Good night to Lila. And we've got, it's 8.50. What I want to do, I think I want to, let's see, anybody have any questions? Otherwise I want to try and like 
walk over to the Gerber with Zoom on a phone, which might work if we're lucky, fingers crossed. And then we can point at things and answer questions. So any questions before we give this a shot? No, maybe not. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, there's, we talked a lot about different uh, tricks that it would take to try and get these things to work. And th they're definitely weird machines and it takes a different kind of thinking. But what's really cool is that you can often do, let's see. Hey, there we go. Corey, we lost your sound, of course. Corey, can Corey. you hear? Oh. We can't hear you, Corey. Hello? Hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Wait, oh. we can't. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay great. We're back. We couldn't before. Okay, cool. So this. This board is a piece that I bought that's about an inch thick from wood that's in the back. And I intend to cut this on the CNC, on the Gerber, with the design that I made. It's, it's a little over, what I want to make is 24 inches by 24 inches. And this is like 26 wide by 25 long. I deliberately oversized it so that I can cut it out with the Gerber later on. So it should give me the chance to cut those things that I'd want. Some of it is going to be decorative lettering, which I'll cut with this V-bit. And so the V-bit like this is going to give me a chance to cut in and do that like fun lettering design on there. But from here, I'm just going to walk in, throw on some goggles, walk into the wood shop. We're going to come over and we can see... Lior is, hi guys, we're actively looking at what they're up to. So on here, they're setting up a work piece to cut into. And so you can see I'm clamping that down. That clamp pressure is gonna be what holds it in place. But the, the bed also has some vacuums underneath that we can look at. Over, let's see, we've got a few pieces that are worth mentioning. This is where the computer lives on the Gerber is inside of this box. It's turned on with this dial and then the green button. Uh, this is for the vacuum to hold down. This is the airline for uh, using air pressure. And then coming around to the other side of the machine, this bridge across the middle, that's the X axis, which is labeled. The Y axis goes along here. And then this is the spindle sorry this is the spindle here this blue guy is a motor that will spin an end mill really quickly and the end mill is held in down here this is all an assembly so that dust can go up through there and be carried away we put a grounding line in there because that dust can build up a static charge so it's important to keep everybody safe by having that grounded and that tube be there um, but this is definitely the bigger the bigger brother to the Shapoko, which just lives right over here, right? And so as you play around with the Shapoko, if it's been a little while, keep in mind that like these are stepper motors, right? This is a stepper and this is a stepper. And so if you played with stepper motors this week, this is very much just a set of steppers. There's one, two, three, uh, and four stepper motors. There's two on the Y axis to make it go that way. And then the spindle doesn't have any control on this. It's just on and off on its own. And what K 
Kate was talking about is that this is often tricky to make happen. You pull the little dust hat off and then there's a button over here to like lock it and change the bit out. It's, it's definitely tricky though. Um, so you want to play with that carefully to make sure that it works the way that you want it to. The, um, this is the power supply for the Shifoko. And in case you're curious, in here is the Arduino-like thing that's really running the whole show. So it's just a bunch of wires that look a lot more like an Arduino project than you might expect uh, to make this thing happen. So it's possible that in the future, we'll be building our own Shifoko-like machines just to build stuff. So let's see, we'll flip this around and head back over here. So, so in the wood shop, you'll be thinking about how do you use the table saw and the joiner to get wood ready so that you can put things together, unless you can find a piece of plywood that's just right for what you're going for. So I'll get out of this room because it'll probably be a little bit quieter. And yeah, that's it. Anybody else want to see anything pointed out? That was cool. I'm I'm wanting to see the video now, the Gerber video. It's posted, you said? Yeah, the Gerber video is posted. It's like, it's an hour and 13 minutes. So it's definitely a long one. And, and it's, Lior did a fantastic job. There's so much good content in there. Um, but it also, at some point, it becomes obvious that Lior was recording on his own. So it's hard to, to it, it becomes a podcast at some point about halfway through where you're listening more than you're watching. So just because it's, it's, it's one, it's a Lior show, holding the camera, carrying it around, trying to talk and record at once. So, which is great. Uh, I look forward to helping him make the next round. We're going to have several, yeah, Lior is a star for sure. We're going to have several versions of this video because we expect it to upgrade when the tool changer comes online for the Gerber. We'll probably record another video. We'll do a series of videos over how do you do the tool chain that goes from uh, maybe a 2D design like Illustrator and then from Illustrator to um, VCarve to the Gerber, that sort of a tool chain, those sorts of things we want to make sure that we take into account as we think about how to move forward. We're also, next week, we plan on covering the Fusion 360 cam and like how you design in Fusion 360 and then take that to the Gerber if you don't want to use VCarve for some reason, which is also totally valid. Um, and then the another thing that's worth talking about is that over the next couple of weeks, we're also going to, we're going to put together the schedule so that you know when the wild card weeks are coming up. That's something that Kate and I have talked about, and I want to make sure that I have buttoned up before I send it out to everybody, but we're looking at getting a little bit of flex time at some point coming up after the CNC. So I should check before I say exactly what week it is. We have it written as a document. We're just going to check it before I push it to the foundations. I think I had forgot to put in the bio week, which I don't want to miss. I just missed it when building the schedule out. So those are, those are all things to look forward to. It's good to see everybody. It's, I'm glad that this is a shift back to like hands-on work, which I think is going to feel good for lots of people. So cool. I think that's probably it. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. There's, there's just a couple of us that are left. Yeah, no problem. Thanks everybody. Have a good night.